let's talk about the mystery charts and the methodology in action. So we have a new mystery chart this week. And you can see this stock really took off and it had a really nice deep retracement. It was also a Landry Light pullback. I'll show you that in just one second. And that's from today's service. I, guess, I don't guess that does much for you. <laughs> but you can see the date. This is the date I first recommended it. This date tends to confuse a lot of people. This is the first day. So if you find the 15th on here, which would probably be like right there, that's when I first recommended it. Anyway, entries here, stop is down here, and the IPT is up here. Let's take a look at that with the Landry Light. Landry Light, for upside Landry Light, is simply lows or greater than the moving average. So you can see lows, obviously greater than moving average. The moving average in this case is the 30 exponential. That's quickly become my favorite moving average, and I'll show you that in crypto too. It works really well in crypto also. But anyway, look down below. You can see the Landry Light count. Remember, it does not measure magnitude, just simply the number of bars. These lows are greater than moving average. So you see right here, really easy to see right here. One, two, three, four, and then on the fifth bar, it hit. Okay, so one, two, three, four. Notice the Landry Light count is going up, even though the chart is going down, the price is going down. So always look at the actual chart. And obviously it's going to go down when you have a pullback like this and notice here it went back to zero if you were scanning for it you'd put in some parameters like 10 or 20 bars of upside landry light and then you'd look for zero when it pulled back to that moving average anyway so that's the setup there and again this doesn't me measure magnitude it simply measures the number of bars but it can help to give you a really good visual presentation i was just doing a presentation for meta stock and i showed some longer term landry light in the charts and i was pretty impressed that uh, just that you could see the big green bars and the big red bars especially when you when you back it way 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 out it really helps you to see the forest from the trees so it's a it's a silly little indicator but i love it i really do and i find myself using it more and more and of course i always eyeball the charts as i preach but anyway you can see the intersection moving average there and the Landry Light goes back to zero. So we'll follow up on that one in upcoming webinars, good, bad, and indifferent. All right, here's a stock that already triggered an entry. Nice Landry Light there. Again, another Landry Light pullback, and then you can see it pull back in the chart, and then it eventually pulls all the way back to the moving average. So that's the parameters that I chose, and that's for a hypothetical 100K account. Although I do take the actual trades. I didn't I didn't do a screen capture today, but I did get in the stock today. Um, I got in pre-market uh, yesterday. It was a it was kind of a fast entry and it came right back in. And then today I got a little anxious, I guess, pre-market because it was really moving pre-market and I felt like I needed to be in it, especially with uh, Bitcoin doing what, what it's doing. And the other thing too is I am under a little bit of pressure because I recommend these things and I want to follow them as mechanical as possible, but I do use a little discretion. I'll show you how the discretion really didn't pay off this week, but it might on upcoming weeks and sometimes it will. Anyway, the entry was there. Again, it triggered yesterday by about six cents on a fast move and it came back in, unfortunately, but it's since recovered from those lows. Now, if you were taking this as a brand new trade, you could use these parameters, but I would also maybe just use the distance for the parameters. But what I would do is I would enter above this high. That's also known as a trend pivot pullback. When you have a little pivot point, sometimes you have a little pivot point, like a false rally out of a pullback, and then it comes right back in. And if it doesn't take out that pivot point, which obviously I hope it does, I know you should never use the word hope, but I hope it does, then that would be the re-trigger. But that's a that's a good little pattern, that little trend pivot pullback. You have a high surrounded by two lower highs, but that's a great little pattern. I guess all my patterns are great little patterns. <laughs> you gotta believe in your stuff, right? <laughs> well, I've spent years and years and years and years looking at them. Like uh, one of you guys said, I think it was Mike Peterson, when he was checking me out, he found some forums that were 20 something years old where I was talking about bow ties, just like I do today. And he was like, okay, well this guy, is talking to talk, walking to walk. He's doing the same thing. 
He's not like some other guy who I'm not going to mention, but I saw he has a new system out just yesterday. And if you buy his newest system, you're going to absolutely print money. But the system he was selling last month, that, that one no longer works, but the new one's going to work, okay? Being a little facetious, obviously. All right, we got a little follow-up on a mystery chart. This one ended badly, spoiler alert. But again, there's that pattern again, the Landry Light pullback. And that was my Metastock last week at Bandcamp presentation that I did, I think it was on last Wednesday, or last Thursday, correction. Anyway, uh, that was kind of my presentation, also kind of a revelation. A while back, we had a string of nice winners. And I went back in and looked at those. And I also looked at some longer term big winners. And I was shocked that they were all Landry Light pullbacks. They might have been trend pivot pullbacks like that prior chart, but they were also Landry Light pullback. They might have been accelerating momentum strategy, but again, they were also Landry Light pullbacks. So pretty cool little pattern, if I say so myself. I received a panicky email from somebody that was a little overwhelmed, and I actually sent them to that webinar I did just on the Landry Light pullbacks. And if you look at my on my YouTube channel and look at the playlist, in fact, maybe uh, trading quick clips would be the place to go. But if you just go to my YouTube channel, YouTube slash Dave Landry, you'll see playlists and go to quick clips. And there's a lot of stuff there on the Landry Light pullback. And what I told this this uh, lady was, it's like, you're trying to figure out everything. And that's exactly how I started the, the webinar. Everybody thinks they need to know everything about trading. And it can be really overwhelming. And that's where you could end up on a holy grail hunt or you know chasing rabbits or whatever you want to say. Go down a rabbit hole of all the different technical indicators. If you're not careful, you could end up doing something really arcane and end up in a lot of trouble. But the bottom line is you don't have to know everything. You just need to know one thing, okay? And one pattern, like Linda Rasky said, all you need is one pattern to be successful. I think this could be just as good as anything else. Uh, Linda Rasky actually has a moving average pattern similar to this, except she uses ADX. I used ADX, by the way, years ago. I know I'm going great circle route but <laughs> i'm doing the weave <laughs> but uh i use adx years ago and it's kind of a long story uh but my problem with it was we were we were held to uh, i don't want to give away too much on this because it's um it's old stuff <laughs> but uh we were we were supposed to pick stocks based on they had to have an adx of, of a certain height a uh, certain number or higher and it just didn't work. And I know this this system worked in prior years. Uh, and so I would kind of modify that just, I would just eyeball the charts and I would, um, every now and then I get caught not using the ADX, but anyway, two drink minimum, all those stories. But um, anyway, I think Rasky's pattern uses the ADX. I prefer to just eyeball a chart and use Landry Light because that ADX could take a long time to catch up. And then ADX, it's a very complex formula. It, it goes up and down. Uh, and so even even in an uptrend, you could have some bars that are taken away from the ADX, whereas the Ledger Light just gives you that count so you can see how long it's been in a trend. Anyway, nice little pullback there. ZK, if you ever want to look at any of these trades, I would say I, I try not to show anything that I haven't recommended before. That's why I put one of my crypto trades into Facebook earlier today so I could talk about it. Not that I'm trading without you guys. It's just uh, sometimes I get busy. Like yesterday, I was showing a, a friend or a day before, I was showing a friend who was interested in markets. I was putting on some crypto trades so he could see them. And, uh, but I will try to put them in the group. But all these stock trades that are core methodology like this, whatever I showed this little spreadsheet on the bottom snippet, or whatever you want to call that screenshot, that's coming straight from my trading service. And those archives are davelander.com slash archives. Anyway, getting back to this chart, entry was here, stop was down here, initial profit target was here. So let's take a look at what happened. The IPT was hit fairly quickly on day three, I believe, if memory serves, maybe day four. And at that point, we banked $1,000. We're up $2,000 per 100K. And then the stop goes to break even. So the worst that can happen, barring, up, barring overnight gaps, would be a scratch on the remainder of the trade. At least you make something right. And unfortunately, this became one where at least we made something. It stopped out. 
I find it's much harder to like when a market just has this huge one day pop and you get your profit target, you feel really good and you just you're all happy. Those are hard to sustain. But if it just kind of gradually bumps along, bumps along, takes a little while to hit the profit target, it's much more boring, but it's far more sustainable. And the real money is going to be in that second low. But anyway, so this is how I this is the spreadsheet. This is the mechanical spreadsheets. And I do put a little discretion on this. In this case, my discretion uh, ended up a little bit worse, but you can see it's 400 shares total. And then we tr we put all those shares on at once. By the way, I, I know I repeat a lot of things, but there's always new people coming in. And we take off half of those shares. In this case, it'd be 200 at the IPT. And then we hold on as long as we can, and we let that stop loosen up over time. Unfortunately, this one stopped back out, but this is better than the poking eye trade. And by the way, I need to dig the email out. It would probably be a good week of charge presentation in and of itself. But uh, this gentleman was asking me, was pointing out all the trades over the last uh, many months, let's see, since I guess six months. And he was pointing out that most of them hit the IPT and came back in. And this question always comes up. Well, Dave, why not take 100% of the profits? In this case, you'd have gotten $2,000. And what I'm getting ready to show you, you got $2,000 versus $1,000 round numbers on 100K. Well, the reason is that second loaf is where the real money is. When you make 500% on the second loaf or two or 300% at least or whatever the case may be, that's when it begins to pay off. Anyway, so you can see I didn't do so hot. I gave up a little bit on the second loaf trying to apply a little discretion and then i ended up uh with a little bit different entry and a little bit different exit so i didn't quite get my thousand but i was the goal was to obviously make a lot of money on the second loaf and that didn't materialize so better the poke of the eye okay nick says we're looking to this is on youtube we're looking to make a buy and you get an early morning gap how do you handle those situations okay uh, real quick, a couple things. If the gap is below your price, then your entry is still valid, obviously. And what you do then is you watch for a fast move on the open, sort of like what Wolf did. Sometimes you'll get these really fast moves on the open and you'll get a trigger that'll come right back in. So that's when you'll have to use a little discretion, say, okay, it's gapped and oh, it's making a fast move. It went through my entry. So now I need to make that no or no or a go or no go decision. And it's kind of a no brainer again, if it's below your entry and unless it spikes right through your entry, it comes right back in and you're willing to apply a little bit of discretion, then you don't take that trade, okay? But as a general statement, as long as the open is below your entry price, then your entry is still valid and you take that entry. Now, again, as I said a second ago, if you get a fast move on the open, gap or no gap, that's when you need to make a decision to see if it comes back in and then possibly do a re-entry. Now, technically, I should have re-entered above the high on the wolf, but since it's already triggered in my service and I felt like I needed to get long before it got away from me, I went in, I got a little uh, excited when I saw Bitcoin, whatever it was, that was 93, then 94, or whatever it was, uh, 1,000 or this morning. Now, if it if it gaps well above your entry, that's when you really need to watch for an open gap reversal. And sometimes you just have to let them go. Okay. So hopefully that helps. Could you use like a 30 minute breakout? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You could um especially if it if it if it gaps up and then comes back in or whatever, then you could look to play a breakout. And if the gap is somewhat sizable, even you could you could even play a breakout. It depends on how far you want to go with it. Okay. If you're kind of a more of a trader type then you can apply the discretion that I just said. And then you, what you might do, and I've done this before too, and I'm trying to think of this a setup. It might've been on the clove, but on one of these stocks, it triggered and came back in and then it was flatlined all day long. But at the end of the day, it had a breakout, intraday breakout. And that's when I got in on that one. So if they kind of gap higher, then kind of go sideways. Yeah, absolutely. It depends on how advanced you are as a trade. I, Nick, I know you've been around a little bit, so I know I know you know what you're doing. So in that case, absolutely. All right, here's the CLOV. This is the former mystery chart. And again, this is kind of uh, accelerating momentum. Notice that the, the price began to accelerate higher. Always look at price, even though the Landry light is kind of cool. Make sure you're looking at price too to see what it's doing. 
But you can see it pulled back to the moving average. Notice you did have one or two more bars of Landry Light before it came back in again. Entry was here, stop was here, IPT was here. So at the IPT, you have 2,000 per 100K. You bank half of that, and then you bring that stop to break even. And then as the market moves in your favor, you trail your stop loosely. And you can see, again, we got stopped out on the second loaf and made a little bit on that. So you can see 1150 overall. The ultimate goal would be a 400% or 500% move on the second loaf. Okay, that's where you want to be. And obviously it didn't happen. So here's my trades here. Not quite as good as the mechanical service. I made 920 in the first loaf and 60 on the second. By the way, this is my, what I call my model account, where I model out the trades as close to the service as possible. That's why I was a little bit more anxious to get in on that wolf because I didn't want to I didn't want to miss the move should it materialize and not be in and have trades to show you. Anyway, so here's one that I announced earlier on Facebook. And this is a bit of a bummer. And this is a problem I've been seeing lately. I've had quite a few of these do this. And I guess I need to set some alarms or something to alert me to this fact. But once again, very simple setup, not quite a Landry Light pullback. I'm sure if you put in a 20 EMA, it probably would be. That was the original pattern. If you look in, I think it was in the layman's guide to trading stocks. Anyway, you can see nice little pullback in this one. I kind of front ran it a little bit instead of getting it in above this bar or higher. I got in sort of midstream. And unfortunately, it came fairly close to that IPT. I'm still in this one, but it didn't quite hit it. I have a limit order in for 20%. Now, in stocks, if you go in and look at that percent risk column, you could see that's my stop distance, which is also my initial profit target distance. Okay. It might seem a little arbitrary if you're new to the trading service, but Basically, what I'm doing is there is some science behind it, and there's a little bit of feel, too. I'm looking at where would I be wrong in the setup. You take a look at that clove, which was $4 a share, and it's a very volatile stock. So it was like a very wide stop, like 30% or 25% or something like that, whatever that was in a little spreadsheet I just showed. And something that's a little bit less volatile, it might only be 10% or 15%. Now, keep in mind, as I've said a thousand times, there's a popular method out there that says you shouldn't lose more than 8% in a stock, that's price value, okay, before getting out. Well, a lot of the stocks that I like to trade, trade 8% in 10 minutes. So that would, you would almost guarantee yourself a, a constant uh, string of losing trades. By the way, uh, tight stops are universally preached. But in reality, you'd actually probably do better if you loosened your stop up a little bit, stops up a little bit, you catch more trends. So this is something I haven't solved for, these near misses in crypto. And, you know, I'm just thinking out loud, maybe I need to put the limit order in and then maybe I need to put in an alert that's somewhere close to the price. But then I kind of like to be a little hands off with this. I've got enough going on without sitting there and watching a crypto screen, screen all day. But anyway. All right, Key says, I had Oklo, took parcels at 25, but then out, stopped out at a gap, now it's recovering. Did you hold on to it? I have some Oklo left, but I'm not, I'm not saying that I did something that was prudent, okay? Remember, I did that, I wouldn't call it a front run, but I played that gap. We could pull the chart later, and that's why I didn't want to put that as one of my examples, because I'm not sure that I use best practices on that. But I only have 100 shares. I did 200 shares. I flipped out 100 for a point gain or whatever it was, and I kept 100. And I do have some. I did. I have a small account that's been dormant for a long, long time, and I put 200 shares in that account a while back. And I'm trying to hang on because it looked like it was. Uh, it looked like it had longer term potential. But that my trading on Oak Club is not necessarily what I'd recommend you do. That's just kind of an, an outlier. Anyway, the uh, as I said a few days ago, was this his first visit? I'm trying to think. This uh, friend of mine from the gym wanted to come by. He wanted to learn how to trade crypto. Unfortunately, he wanted a secret formula, and he doesn't. I don't think he wants to work. But uh, 
so he's probably not watching, so I could pick on him. <laughs> you know, I used to tell everybody, oh, just don't worry, it'll be fine. But then I realized that I'm just doing a disservice to everyone and by not giving them tough love and, and so they, they don't spend 10 years of their life or, or longer spinning their wheels, as I've seen a lot of people do. But anyway, with this crypto, when the crypto is really running these, these SHYT coins, the shit coins, sometimes you just buy them and they're going straight up. And we're, we're going to take a look at the live ones in a minute and maybe see if we can find something we could trade. And then again, I'm using, I don't think I've closed the loop on this earlier, but I'm using a 20% initial profit target. And I probably should be doing some analysis to figure out the volatility of the pairs like I'm doing in stocks. But right now, it just seems when these things are blowing and going, they could easily go another 20%. And that just seems like a good round number. Hey, Sharon, how you doing? Good to see you. It's been a while. Like I've been saying, uh, I've been mining off some Bitcoin. When I make profits in these altcoins, I take a tiny bit amount and I put it in Bitcoin. And that's actually begun to add up a little bit there's a few thousand dollars now and bitcoins from this little experiment so that's that's been a lot of fun now i am hodling that which i don't recommend but if you're doing it at a very small size i think you're okay like i'm doing here because i'm taking a very small amount of money i'm pretending that i have the high commissions that i had i would kill for 25 dollars commission <laughs> 20 years ago when the commissions were ridiculous. But anyway, so I'm taking just a little bit off and putting a Bitcoin, but each little crumb is beginning to add up. Now, I think this one went 100%, and I meant to look at it earlier. And that's another thing that I might do too, and I have done in the past, is I'll put in a limit order at 100% to take a little bit off. And in these Bitcoins, these Bitcoins, I sound like the old people, these uh, altcoins, a lot of times they'll they'll spike up and they come right back in. And that's why it's good to have that limit order in place when you're trading these. And again, we'll take a look. We'll get the crypto corner in a few minutes. We'll take a look at the live crypto. And so there's the IPT. I mined off a little bit right around the time that IPT was hit. All right, I'm going to go through this really quickly because it's kind of beating a dead horse on this system. But the zones are, and Jeff's here tonight. Jeff uh, was my motivation to put the zone lines in here. Jeff likes to get out of the market when the overall market that is, is down 5% or more. I find that 10% or more is a good round number. And my whipsaw filter is the 50 day, 50 week, I'm sorry, simple moving average there. That's a sell signals. And I have plenty of YouTubes on this. If you want to go check them out. But it closed below the moving average and it closed 10% or more away from the 50 week closing high is a sell signal and a buy signal is two bars of landry light this is weekly landry light on a 50 simple and the reason i use a simple by the way is i wanted lag built into this system and it's just the opposite of what people will tell you it's like oh you want to eliminate the lag well you can't eliminate the lag and in fact you want to build in a little lag to a system to keep you from chasing your tail this is a longer term system and I'm kind of putting on a different hat here. This is a mechanical system, but I do use it to help me judge the markets. For instance, uh, just to keep just to keep it simple, and and so I'm, I don't go crazy with my leftover daughter's college funds. I'll when this thing gives me a sell signal, I'll get out of the market. When I get a buy signal, I'll put them back in. Okay. And for SGs, I did a Q trade. I'll show you in just one second. Anyway, so it's had a pretty good run since that last buy. Again, two bars of Landry Light closed within 10% of the 50-week closing high. And it also has to be above the moving average, which it will when that happens. Now, the sell is way down here below the moving average. Now, eventually, this moving average might get above the 10% line. And if it does, then the 10% line becomes your sell. Right now, the sell looks like it's 5000 333 might be a little bit higher with today's price. And by the way, we're using a calendar chart, okay? So you you would sell on a Friday and, and I guess that could we could end up with some issues with that if the market crashed somewhere before Friday, but right now that seems to have worked out okay for the last 100 years at least. And my thinking just real quick and not to back into the whole thing, but this is a diaper change avoidance type of system. Ian McActivy would call it a diaper change moment when the whole world goes unglued, comes unglued, 
and markets implode? Well, my thinking is uh, along the lines of technical analysis 101 is if a market is going to lose half of its value, it's going to lose 10% first. So 10% is a good round number to get out. Let me just check on YouTube here real quick. So here's a cues. Go long 100 shares here and the stop is here. And again, if you squint your eyes, one, two bars of Landry Light and you buy, you buy market on close. And then the stop would be way down here at 455. But that's been an incredible run. Now I've given up, um, I forget how much in the last two weeks, this was 60% plus, but still it's a pretty good little run, 185 points, almost 186 points to when I grab this mark to market. And that comes out to an $18,595 gain. And this back here was a, it was just a hundred shares, 31,000 dollar investment investment so to speak so that's been a pretty good run i was thinking a few days ago i don't know if i'm going to follow this mechanically forever and it's like after such a good run you're going to feel kind of cocky like oh i'll follow it and it's probably due for quite a bit of whipsaw by the way if you're following something like this longer term trend following you will get a lot of whipsaw and your accuracy will be fairly low although i have to say um knock on wood but you could I can get you the spreadsheet if you want. And I just hand tested this, by the way. The uh, spreadsheet looks pretty good and the accuracy is decent. And it does keep you out of the market about 30% of the time. Those are the, that's the best time to be out of the market when you have a sell signal for the most part. And uh, if you have time, read, or oh, if you don't have time, read it anyway. <laughs> read Greg Morris's book. And he does a lot of talking. He kind of turns a lot of this stuff on its head. Like uh, they'll tell you, well, if you miss the if you miss the ten biggest days, you're not gonna make a lot of money. And look at this chart. Well, what if you miss the ten worst days? Okay, that tend to happen after ten percent. And I'll have to show you the graphs of the ten percent or more moves. And you could see you could when you look at that, you could see that there's some pretty substantial moves. And the in the spreadsheet, I have the percentage change that go that it goes down afterwards. Anyway, uh, just real quick, one thing that I quickly found out: the drawdowns with this or any long-term trend following system will be substantial. So you can see that was a forty-four hundred dollar drawdown, and it actually, after being up quite a bit substantially, maybe six or seven grand here, this actually could have gone to zero but fortunately i did not get a sell signal that little spill there was thirty six hundred dollars this one here kind of hurt that was an eight thousand dollar drawdown now when i got in this i'm like eh, this is sgs who cares i figured i'd lose a couple hundred four hundred bucks or whatever or make a couple thousand whatever and, and it would just be something to do for sgs i wasn't expecting it to turn into actually real money i mean this uh with the with the cues at at 50 or 500 or something, that's $50,000. So that's kind of crazy. Even ludicrous would say that's ludicrous. So the other thing I was looking at a few minutes ago is that, wow, this thing stops out. That's going to be a $6,000 drawdown, but it's been a pretty damn good run. So in the end, by the way, all trades end badly. Now, as from my perspective, from a trend follower's perspective, somebody who wants to stay with a trade, as long as it moves in your favor. I guess if you're using some sort of option strategy with the butterfly and the iron condor wings and it's got a it's got to close right here and then everything works out. Yeah, that could that could end optimally as one of my clients pointed out. He says he says you shouldn't say it ends badly. He says not optimally. Well, they all end badly, okay? Because in the end you're going to give up some of the open profits. Look at those two last which I consider decent trades. I'm happy I took both of them. Don't get me wrong. I always have clients complain. You know, they complain when they give up that second low. It's like, well, just send me whatever you made on the entire trade, that $1,000 or whatever the case may be, depending on your account size. And, uh, you know, keep a couple hundred bucks out as I preach, as I say, ad nauseum. Go get your massage so you could forget about that troublesome cast that you made on that trade and forget about the aggravation of that, that drawdown of open profits. By the way, as I said a thousand times, uh, Dennis, 
from the Turtles. He was one of the uh, Dennis and Eckerd were the original Turtles that put together the team of Turtles. And Dennis was okay based on Curtis Facebook Trading from the Gut, which is a great little book. Oh, that, that was actually this turtle book, The Way of the Turtle. Um, if you're going to read a turtle book, read the turtle books that are written by turtles. I have a bit of a problem when somebody comes in and takes somebody else's stuff and, may, and, and you know, sells it as their own or whatever um, that weren't even part of the team or whatever. So that's, I, I don't know. Let me stay away from that. <laughs> But do read uh, his book, and, and where I'm going with that is I swore I would never read the turtle books because they were written by non-turtles. And then um, Larry McMillan said, well, you need to read Curtis' Facebook. And so if Larry McMillan tells me to do something, as long as it's legal, uh, I'll do it. Anyway, uh, as I've said quite a bit, we'll just go through this real quick. I Years ago, I did this, and then for whatever reason, I, I guess it became a lot of work, and the market got choppy, and I didn't feel like doing it anymore. But uh, I would just buy new highs, so to speak. This is the only thing that's not real trading. This is hypothetical here. But all I do is I, I buy new 52-week highs. The formula is about that big, and I run the scan every day. And it, it really doesn't take that long. And I just kick out the losers and put in good looking stock so it's almost a constant window dressing where i'm kicking out the poor performers and keeping the strong ones so this is mighty impressive and there's really not that many losers in here now but i do kick them out frequently okay but you can see this is at a pretty good move and the thing that's amazing is all of these were bought at brand new highs so this one here on 9 11 you can see it's breaking out the brand new highs and it really took off. Now, one thing that I've talked about before is, number one, you can't do this with just one or two stocks. You're gonna need a, a, a sizable amount. And, and I know we got into statistics a couple of weeks ago, and um, I forgot to follow up on that. All right, there's so much going on, but um, I'm not sure, you know, the 100 just seemed like a good round number, and that seems to work really well. And cash is also treated as an asset class, so if I can't find 100 stocks, then each slot, so to speak, uh, will you know, that I can't find a stock for. Let's say if I got 80 stocks, and then there might be 20 slots of cash. And uh, right now, I'm doing this with a hypothetical million. 10k goes into every position, and it's been a lot of fun. And it's a great, it's a great learning experience. It's kind of fascinating. I know you're part of it with me, but <laughs> it's kind of fascinating in that. Like a while back, utilities were on fire and, and they might be coming back. We'll take a look at them in a second. And I would never, never say never, but it's like in the past, I've never traded utilities, but they're becoming the hot momentum because of the AI, because of the, uh, I guess crypto mining might have a little bit to do with that. But the AI right now is going to be the big, the big deal. In fact, uh, was it Amazon just bought a, a, a nuclear facility, I think? Anyway, if you look at these numbers, I think I have enlarged here. So this is ran 200 and I put 238. It should be 228. It might have been 238 when I looked at it earlier. But anyway, uh, all of these, again, bought at new highs. You can see these numbers are just ridiculous going back to, I think I started at the end of May. It looks like the oldest one in here might have a June date right there. And that's GEV, and that's up 100%. So this kind of shows me where the money is flowing. I need to get around to doing it, but a while back, I had uh, I made these 3D pie graphs on, and you could see the sector action and all. I mean, some really geeky stuff. I'd love to get back into all that. And if anybody knows software that could help facilitate a lot of this stuff, just let me know. But I zoomed them in, and you could see these numbers are are, are pretty big. This is just the first. I guess 40 or so of these. And you can see that a lot of triple digit gains in here, quite a few triple digit gains, three, <laughs> but a lot of 94% and 90%. So and it's just, you're just buying brand new highs. That's all you're doing with that. And by the way, I did a, a couple times, I've been approached by people in stock picking contests. And if you were, if you have a child that's gonna enter a stock picking contest, just to keep things simple, just tell them to buy new highs, okay? And they'll probably do okay. 
especially if they're in a ripple roaring bear market. Now, I mentioned this one in the Facebook group. This is an IPO, although I think if you check other charting services, this one might not be as new as it seems. So, you you know, the map is not the territory. I say that often. People are like, what do you mean by that, Dave? Well, here's here's like an IPO could set up this little IPO pattern. But in reality is it's a stock that's been trading for a long time. So it's not really an IPO. So, <laughs> you know, as I've said before in one of the million little things presentations, trading is a million little things about a million little things. There's a lot of little stuff to keep up with. It's not hard, but there's a lot to it, and it's far from easy, too. Anyway, this was an opening, this was kind of an opening gap reversal, and I also felt like it could turn into a buy at B, which again, you could argue that, okay, wait a minute, this is not an IPO, but I thought it was at the time. So my thinking was buying strength uh, intraday, and the buy was here and the sell was here, and I'll show you how I played that on an intraday basis. And Again, I thought this was an IPO at the time. So buy at B would have been a buy right here. And then I saw this little opening gap reversal. I think it was worth a shot. But I just took it as a day trade. So you can see I got in just a couple of other shares, kind of S and G stuff. 2804, round numbers 2857. And this is what it looks like on the intraday chart. So I let it open. And then when I saw it begin to rally, I bought it here. And then it just kind of waned later in the day. And then I got out here at 50 something. So ideally you want to kind of hang, you want to try to hang on, but it just couldn't hit the initial profit target. So I just felt like it was better than the poke in the eye, better than the poke in the eye type of trade. 